All right, here we go, X-Men fans. Let's catch up with Kitty Pride in Chicago as she tries to put her life as a superhero in the past, unfortunately with mixed results. Can Kitty keep out of the X-Men life or will the X-Men life come after her? Let's find out in our review of exceptional X-Men number one from Marvel Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of exceptional X-Men number one from Marvel Comics. Just to get it out of the way, let's get down to business before you hear, see, read another word. No, this is not the worst X title out of Tom Brevoort's From the Ashes era. That honor still belongs to NYX. Exceptional X-Men number one by Evel Ewing is also not a particularly terrible comic. That should be good news, which it already exceeds expectations based on how it was marketed. However, eh, Exceptional X-Men number one is a largely depressing, slow comic that clues you into Kitty Pride's post krakoa life in Chicago while planting a few seats for the future, and that's just about it. Exceptional X-Men number one begins with a day-in-the-life look at Kitty Pride as she endeavors to lay low and blend into the human population. She's living in Chicago with her platonic roommate Preeti, and she tends bar at a local establishment called Lulu's Tavern. For good or for ill, Evel Ewing sets up Kitty's life well enough without too much exposition or lengthy narration boxes. You get the lay of the land in Kitty's life, even if you're missing the context as to how or why she chose to settle in Chicago. From the narration, you see that she tends to move around and she sets her home up wherever her heart is, particularly with her mutant family, quote unquote. But as to why she picked Chicago, it's really not clear, but it works well enough. Once we get past the setup, what follows is a steady, almost sleepy amount of narration expressing how sad Kitty is about her life. Kitty is sad that she's no longer surrounded by her mutant family. She's sad that the conflict with Orcus, quote unquote, forced her to become a murderer. I'll talk more about that in a second. And she's also sad that she doesn't feel like her life has any purpose. So all she does is work herself into exhaustion every day while being, to be fair, somewhat mopey. And that preceding description pretty much lays out the majority of the tone and focus of this issue. Kitty is sad, full stop. I mean, that's pretty much the, the heart of it. Consequently, the vibe and tone through most of the issue is a depressing sadness as Kitty struggles to do anything without moping. That's not to say Kitty should be rainbows and sunshine every minute of every day. No, that's not what we're trying to say at all. But you get more of that glum depression that infected so much of Gail Simone's uncanny X-Men number one. But in this case, more so. Also, Kitty's sadness over being quote-unquote forced to become a killer sounds like revisionist hogwash, especially when we have multiple scenes of Kitty laying waste to low-level Orcus guards simply standing around. When you snap a guy's neck when he never had a chance, that's a long way from saying I was forced to murder somebody. To shake off what would be called a pretty wicked case of the Mondays, Kitty heads out to a local concert where she plans to meet up with her date. Unfortunately, Kitty's date didn't turn out because she showed up a day too early. Yikes. So she decided to check out a different concert by a group called Bunny Starlight Dreams, BDS for short. While she waits in line, she sees a girl get refused admittance by the bouncer. When the bouncer gives the girl a shove to tell her to move on and get out of here, the girl unleashes her mutant powers on the guard. The altercation escalates very quickly, and the bouncer pulls a guard to defend himself, prompting Kitty to intervene and spirit the girl away. And now we get to the heart of it. Of course, fate is going to step in to pull Kitty back into fighting for other mutants because she's just not going to get away from it. Unfortunately, the scene comes off as too over the top to get readers on Kitty and the girl's side. Should the bouncer have shoved the girl to get her to move along? No, that's not nice. You don't put hands on somebody, although bouncers are kind of there for that reason. Should the girl have unleashed her metallic tentacles to attack the bouncer? No, absolutely not. Should the bouncer have defended himself from an attack that would scare the hell out of anyone? 100% yes. If the goal was to garner sympathy for this girl, this young mutant who maybe is not in control of herself, Ewing completely botched it. I don't know why the people in the X office keep screwing up this point. If you're afraid or in a tough situation, unleashing what could be lethal mutant powers on a human is not a good idea. And I don't know why the X office doesn't get that and thinks that somehow that's going to garner sympathy for any one of their characters. After a phase-shifting game of cat and mouse through the surrounding buildings, Kitty and the girl get away and they either get back to Kitty's car or they steal a car. It's not quite clear whose car it was. 
in the car, Kitty gives Trista Marshall, which is the girl's name, her ID, so that the girl has, quote unquote, collateral if Kitty tries to kidnap her. I'm not sure how that's supposed to work. That bit seemed very confusing. I don't know. It seemed like some kind of weird safety measure, but the, it, the way it plays out doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Later, the girl gets home to her loving grandmother, and Kitty goes back to her apartment to sleep off a relatively exciting evening. The issue concludes with Kitty finding an incredibly decorative gift box on her doorstep to brighten her day, and Emma Frost, out of nowhere, making a psychic phone call to Kitty. And that's it. That's all there is to the issue. So let's talk about the positives and the negatives, starting with the positives. What's great about Exceptional X-Men number one? At this point, it's almost impossible to say if Evel Ewing nailed Kitty's character because Kitty's undergone so many radical shifts of late. Still, Kitty's presented as a believable character who has been through the ringer. Her inner monologue feels somewhat authentic for a person wrestling with sadness and depression. And the brief bit of action we get is reasonably well done. So let's shift over to the negatives. What's not great about Exceptional X-Men number one? Again, the one action scene mentioned above, Trista Marshall's rescue, didn't do much to put the reader on Trista's side because her overreaction escalated the scenario exponentially. And I'm going to put this out here. Based on Tristan's mannerisms and manner of speech, you could surmise Trista is on the autism spectrum or suffering from some form of relational dysfunction. I don't know if that's what Evel Ewing intended, but that's the way it sort of comes across. There's nothing wrong with having an autistic character, but the kitty that's presented here isn't ready for that kind of challenge. And given the X office's difficulties presenting believable characters of late, going down the autism road feels like an invitation to disaster. On the other hand, if Ewing didn't intend to write Trista as an autistic character, she's written very poorly. <laughs> Boy, beyond the character work, Ewing's plot is, to be frank, just slow. There, there, there are no wow moments of any sort, and it doesn't set you up for the purpose of this series. The first issue of any series should always give you some kind of major hook that pulls you in. Ewing slathers the plot with so much slow, depressing meandering that you'll have no idea what's going to happen, and you may not want to know if it's more of the same. Marvel comics are, first and foremost, superhero comics. I don't know why modern Marvel writers don't understand that. This needs to feel like a superhero comic, and right now, Exceptional X-Men number one does not. Let's switch gears and talk about the art for a second. Carmen Carnero, in my book, is a respected artist, and this issue is a pristine example of why. The figure work and the facial acting, and there's a lot of facial acting here, are excellent. Panels are well done and complete particularly the backgrounds. And that's not common these days. You get a lot of panels where there's no background or just some kind of gradient or a uh, flat color. Here, all the panels look well done. They look completely, look fully developed, which is a good thing. And the action scene is on point. I mean, it's not much as far as contributing to the plot, but it's well done. Plus, Nolan Woodard's coloring is solid. As a whole, the art team did a great job. So final thoughts, what do we think about exceptional X-Men number one? It's not the worst or the best new X title out of the From the Ashes era. Evel Ewing's turn on the X-Men title gives you all you need to know about Kitty Pride's whereabouts with lots of emotion and a fair bit of introspection. That said, the issue lacks wild moments, the one action scene feels forced as far as how it came to pass, and this first issue tells you almost nothing about where this series is headed or why it exists in the first place. Therefore, Exceptional X-Men number one earns a 6.2 out of 10, and some people may even feel that it might be a little bit generous after you read it. It's not the best nor the worst X title, but a mediocre start is just not a good start. But what do you think? How hyped are you for Exceptional X-Men? Leave a thumbs up if you're an X-Men fan, and leave a comment below with your expectations about where this series should go next. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.